Welcome back. Now, Victor, you're also right. A lot of your writing is satire, um, which I enjoy tremendously, but you also seem to enjoy it very much. You, would I be correct in saying that you like, you know, poking fun at the establishment and thoroughly enjoy it? It's fun. Uh, I think my father used to say that the only time you, the only opportunity you ever have of turning the king's neck, whatever you wish, is when you are cutting his hair. Oh, that's deep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so satire has allowed me to do that, you know, so because uh, it's not like Nigeria is, you know, like it's, it's, it's not safe to actually write and be critical these days, but I, I prefer satire. It makes me laugh. People love it. You know, they want to laugh at things that are, um, that are critical, you know. I decided to, to be doing satire. First, my father was a satirist, by the way, but an oral satirist, you know, he would never, he will always catch truth with laughter, you understand, you know, so he's not. How, is it, how important is it that we do capture truth and tell the truth? Truth is important to a nation's health. The moment you take away truth from a nation is dead, pretty much. And, um, you know, you can't bury the truth. And I, I've seen it done here, times without number, and he always come back to bite us. So that's why we have to say truth all the time, is, 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 the, is the vital signs of a nation. Speaking to the Financial Times of London about your work, um, I saw a quote from you where you said that you feel you would be a fraud if you did not um, reflect some of the issues that face Nigeria in the things that you do. What did you mean? You can't look at something um, that is going wrong and not say something about it. It's not that you are going to say everything that is wrong, otherwise you almost, it would drive you bananas, you know. So, but the obvious ones, the ones that people want to like just ignore and gloss over, I bring them because that is the work of the artist really to kind of like reinterpret things, the good and the bad, you know. So um, I mean that statement by every, I'm, I'm here, I relocated to the country and there's a reason why I have stayed this long, you know, it was, it's not the easiest thing to do, but yes, we, we, we have to, for you to build a nation, it's not just physical bricks and mortar, you know, it's by what are you contributing to the nation? How much of truth are you telling the nation in a way, in a country? Because, I mean, people are going to ask questions later. A generation is coming that's going to ask us, what did you guys do? And I don't want to not be able to answer that question. You, you recently published a book called Excuse Me, Sir. Excuse me, not, no, oh, sir. It's, it's no, sir. I'm okay. removed the sir. My editor <laughs> removed the sir. Like, you're not talking to little men. You know, okay. So. <laughs> okay, so Excuse Me. Yes. yes, that's true. It was called Excuse Me. Um, Excuse me, how did that title come about? I, you know, like when I was working in Next as the creative director, I had just finished my MFA in creative writing and I wanted to write, you know, instead of a different career shift entirely designing newspaper. And um, it, was, it, was, it was something, I, I was looking for a catchphrase, something to draw your attention because it comes from a background of what are your headlines saying? What, what, how do you bring people to your, to, to your writing or to your art? You know, so excuse me is very like, you know, if, you, if you're angry, like, excuse me. Or if you want somebody to give you away, you say, excuse me. So in Nigeria, they in, say, excuse me, excuse uh -huh. me. Uh -huh. yeah. so, you see, so, <laughs> so I was looking for that, that word that we, or that phrase that will work for me um, in, that, in that regard. Because you had heavy writers then. You have Pius Adesomi, you have uh, okay, uh, Okain Dibé, Dibé, you have uh, Jibril, Jibril, Jibril Aminu, you, ha uh, Jibril Brian. Brian. you have uh, even uh, the, the one that was writing the fifth column for us. Femi Aribisala. Femi Aribisala. And, you know, they were heavy hitters, you know, so I didn't want that to be part of that whole heavy hitting crowd, you know, so I, I needed to kind of stay away from that kind of heavy hitting and now bring something. So only something serious, but coated, coated in lightness. Yes. And when you decided to put it together as a book and you launched it, what was it like in terms of uh, the reception? Did people 
like it? Did people respond to it positively? Yeah, I would say so because, you see, they were all online, but when, when they could no longer be assessed online, I decided to figure out a way to extract them and make them, you know, compile them as a book and now people can become accessible. So I would say that it has been well. It sold out, the first print sold out within the few weeks that it came out and the two universities are actually using them now in their creative writing schools. In their oh, excellent. Which department. universities? University of Benin is a recommended text for the uh, School of Journalism, um, uh, Mass Communications Department and the English Department of, uh, of um, Abrosali University. Partiality. Well, I, mean, <laughs> alumni, I, 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 I spoke a lot about Ecoma, <laughs> so they have to relate to it. <laughs> so satire, in excuse me, I'm the truth but quoted in humor. Um, but then just before these elections, you launched a campaign called Ink, Not Blood. Um, there was nothing humorous about that campaign. It was straightforward. Um, what were you trying to achieve with this campaign? Well, the number one thing was to make sure that we, we have peace, we, we have a peaceful process. So my number one goal was to make sure there was peace throughout the election, you know. So despite the fact that we have uh, pockets of violence here and there and, you know, later on during the, um, um, during the governorship, the gubernatorial elections, we had uh, uh, um, some violence, you know. So, but there was this palpable fear in the country towards leading towards the election where a lot of people were talking about wars, you know, if my candidate is not the winner of this election, there is going to be war, we will fight and all those, you know, and there were, you know, and people weren't talking much about peace, you understand? So for those of us that want peace in the country, you know, so we also have to remind these people, even if they are talking about war, do they really know what they are talking about? So what you did know? the campaign actually entail? The campaign was to make sure that you remind people that this can be achieved. Like, you don't have to vote with blood. You know, ink is, you know, it is the kind of like the symbol for voting. You know, and ink is what I use mostly in my paintings, in my writing, you know. So I chose that, that you can achieve more with ink than with blood. So ink, not, not blood. blood. Yes, that's where that came from. Mm. And, and um, uh, what, what did you do? How did you well, go about, you know, um, publicizing this, this campaign? I took quotes, you know, famous quotes uh, of, about peace, you know, so about Einstein, Martin Luther King, you know, all the, all the uh, greats that have embraced peace throughout their lives, um, you know. So those ones, I took them, I kind of create something like posters with them, post them on Facebook, post them on, uh, on Twitter, uh, post them on Instagram, then we did, I did some paintings to reflect the whole thing, you know, then did t-shirts, which I gave out to friends, some people donated some money to make more, you know, so that went really out there, so that when people are wearing them, some wore it to the polling booth and all those things, you know, so when people are wearing them, you know, there's no way I can go and say this thing probably spoke to this person, and made him change his mind, you know. So, but I know that there's it's no just doing. Yes, yeah. There's no way of me measuring. I it. saw stickers too. I yeah. Think, so I did stickers, stickers, you know. So I gave gave them all out and all that, you know. So it was it was me saying this is the little I can do. I, I don't have a financial backing from anybody, you know. So the little I can do for my country to make sure I promote peace, I did, you know. So and I I employ everybody to do that. I think people are looking that. For you to change the entire nation, it has to be a monumental change. No, it's, it's from your angle, whatever you can do, from your little angle, if you're a organizer, you know, do the right thing. If you're a carpenter, do the right thing. If you're an artist, do the right thing. If you're a journalist, do the right thing. And when all those things come together, then we we'll actually like experience the change that we're looking for. Now, I have you quoted as saying that you have no control over where the muse takes you. What do you mean? If, if I feel like, if I have a strong urge here now to get up and go and paint when I leave this place, instead of my next stop, I will not even fight it. I'll go. So, but you see, when you talk like that, right, <laughs> what, what, you come across as the traditional stereotype of the artist we know, the crazy artist. <laughs> and yet, every time I look at you, I used to think, 
for someone so creative, you look very sane. Because, you know, we know I've artists managed, to be... <laughs> I've managed my madness. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I, I have managed it, you know. Um, you know, so, I mean, that you can control things, really. I mean, I don't want to live that kind of life or to say, okay, you have to, like, be crazy to know that. You just let the work speak for themselves and still maintain a, a proper, <laughs> sane life and accessible life, you know, so... Are you making a decent living from your art? Um, I guess... I guess so. Um, if you have a master's in technology management, those things come to play, you know. So it's almost like an MBA. So I guess those have been able to help me in managing the little that I get and figure out how can I turn that around. Is the worth of the art we produce tied to our self-worth as a people? Because I've heard people make that argument that until as a people you begin to value yourselves and what you produce, it is not likely that other people will, that value. Other people will value it. Oftentimes, it's, it's, it's sad that oftentimes we have to wait for others to come and value it for us before we now wake up and realize We wait for value. validation. Yes. And, but luckily enough, there have been people, patrons of the art in this country, collectors, very strong collectors, that I, I wouldn't want to rubbish what they have done for, for the art in this country, that are promoters of the art, that are those that have stood their ground, that are those that have gone to bed hungry, just to be able to make sure that Nigerian art gain what it has gained today. But we can do enough. We, we can do more, you understand? They have not had the backing of past government. And you think that is critical? It's critical. It's very, very critical. Okay, so you paint, you write, you do photography, um, you do cat wheels and flip <laughs> all your hands. But no, on a serious note, um, is there anything that you still want to do that you feel you haven't done? Yes. I want to collaborate with an architect to build museums around Nigeria. How can a country where you have maybe the artist, artist, one of the highest selling artists in Africa and we can say now the world, actually recites and operates from Nigeria, whereby works of, his works are selling for about 1.5 million and above dollars. Hmm. Yet, and you are talking yet, about, people come it's good here. to say who yeah. this is because people watching might not know. Yeah. Um, Ella Natsui. Ella Natsui. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you now realize that when some people come to the country, they are expecting what they probably have in their country, like a big museum that they can visit. And we don't, there is really nothing to visit. Victor, thank you so much thank for you coming much, on Sandra. the program. Appreciate it, thank you. You've been watching Straight Talk with me, Kadria Ahmed, and my guest was visual artist, writer, photographer, and activist, Mr. Victor Ehikameno. We discussed his work, what inspires him, and his hopes for the future. Join me next week when I'll be in conversation with another special guest. Have a good evening.